Hey Savvy people, it's Savvy Nick here and today we'll be installing Arch Linux by itself as the only thing on an empty storage disk. What this video will take you through is the process of downloading, flashing, and installing Arch Linux on an empty storage disk on an UEFI based BIOS system, including setting up users and networking. Alright, I'm here on the archlinux.org website where we'll be downloading Arch Linux from. We'll need an install image, so go to the download section, and then we'll see the latest release here is March 1st, 2021. It tells you the kernel and the ISO size. We'll continue down the page until we get to the various different mirrors. Select the country closest to you. Mine's going to be the United States, and you can select whatever mirror you're comfortable downloading from. For me, I'm going to select the kernel.org. It's a reputable mirror, and I want to select the Arch Linux 20210301, so March 1st, 2021 image. It's for the x86 64-bit architecture. It's an ISO file, and we're going to flash this image after we're done downloading. Select it to start the download process, and make sure to save it somewhere on your computer. And if you're new and stopping by to watch a video today, make sure to subscribe below and hit that notification bell for more Linux and programming videos. Now that I've downloaded the ISO, I'm going to launch and use the Belena Etcher app. I'll go down to the start menu and search for Belena and start it. Here's Belena. I'll go ahead and click on that and bring the app up. You can also use any other bootable disk creator such as Unet Bootin or Rufus. I just like the ease of use here in Belena. I'll select the image that I just got done downloading by going to select image and searching for the Arch Linux ISO file that I just got done downloading, clicking on it and selecting open. Next I can select whatever USB, CD or DVD I want to flash the image to by clicking change here. By default, Belena will pick up on a USB CD or DVD if it finds one on your computer. So make sure you go in here and select the proper one because it will flash over the contents and erase everything on that USB CD or DVD. I only have the one, so I'll select my SanDisk Cruiser USB. Four gigabytes is more than enough. So after I have the proper one selected, I'll hit continue. And then all I have to do is hit flash and the flash process will start right after I give the program administrative privileges. I'll hit yes and the process will begin. Now this might take a few minutes and if everything goes successfully, you'll just see a flash and then verify that flash process and let you know that it's finished. All right, and once the flash is complete, you'll get this screen letting you know that in Belena. And now it's time to exit out and take the USB CD or DVD that you just got done flashing to the computer of your choice where you want to install Arch Linux and insert it there so you can use the newly created bootable media to install Arch Linux. And if you went ahead and made it this far, please smash that like button for me. It really does help me out. All right, I've taken my USB over to the computer where I want to install Arch on. And now I need to get into my BIOS settings. For me, this is done by selecting the F2 or delete key during the boot process. You'll have to find your specific key in order to get into your BIOS for further setup. All right, and after spamming that F2 or delete key for me, I'm welcomed by a page here, this UEFI BIOS utility. I'm currently in the easy mode, and what I'm looking for is a boot order or boot priority where I can set the and disk cruiser that I was using. It has four gigs, so I know this is the proper device that I want to boot from. I can move it up, at least in mine here, to be at the top of the boot priority, and that's enough for me. I can save and exit at this point, but your BIOS might look a little different, so I'll show you the advanced mode because yours might look more similar to this. If I go into the advanced mode, up top we see different categories and tabs. I'm looking for one called boot or boot order. I see it right here. With that selected, I can go down and find my boot option priorities or boot order and change the boot option number one. So it again is the USB CD or DVD that we just got done creating. I have the UEFI Sand Disk Cruiser 1100 selected. It's four gigs. I know that's the one that I just got done creating. It matches all the criteria. So I'll select that one. And now I can go over to exit and make sure to save my changes and restart the computer. So if I do that and hit OK, this will reboot the computer once more and it should load into our Arch Linux 
installer from the live image. This time I won't press anything to get into BIOS. And here we go. We're welcomed by a screen. This is a good sign. It says the Arch Linux install medium is available here. It is clearly labeled UEFI and I'm ready to continue the process of installing Arch Linux. If you went ahead and made it this far, please smash that like button for me. It really does help me out. Let me start this process by pressing enter on the first option and I'll take a moment as a few things load up. All right, here I'm on the Linux console where I will begin my installation process for Arch Linux. First, I'll mention if you are using a different key map than the default English US keyboard, then set up your keyboard by searching in the user share KBD key maps directory that can be done by LS space forward slash user forward slash share forward slash KBD key maps forward slash. And if you tab a few times, you can see the different categories that we have. I'll go under the I386 for an example. And then if I tab again, I have different variants of the keyboard. I'll go to the QWERTY. Here I see the various different key maps available. And now if I wanted to use one of these, I would make note of it. And then I could type in load keys and then select a proper key map such as the no Latin one key map. Either way, this is only necessary if you have something than the non-default US English keyboard, which I do, so I won't be doing this. I'll also say if you're having trouble seeing your font, you can change up your font in the console and I do have a video for that as well. I'll make sure to post that video in the description below. And the next thing we want to do is verify that our system is UEFI based. So since this is a UEFI based BIOS computer, as most modern computers will be, we'll confirm that our system's boot mode is UEFI based by doing ls space forward slash sys forward slash firmware forward slash EFI and then forward slash EFI vars. If we press enter, you should see some kind of output with that command. If there is no output, that means that something's off and you are not currently booted into a UEFI mode. So confirm that before moving along. And if you don't get any kind of output, you could have legacy based or MBR based BIOS, which requires a different type of install path. So make sure to verify that first. The next thing we'll want to do is verify that we have an internet connection since the install will require some packages to be downloaded from the internet onto your system. Let's ping archlinux.org and if you get a reply, it's good. But if you need to connect to Wi-Fi first and you don't have a wired connection because a wired connection will just pick right up because of the pre-installed tools on this live media, let's connect our Wi-Fi up by typing IWCTL. Also, I suggest using Wi-Fi at least initially because it's a little easier to set up after the installation. Otherwise, there's some extra steps for getting a wired connection going. But with this tool, IWCTL, we'll be able to set up our Wi-Fi. First type device list. This will list all devices that are available for Wi-Fi and it will list out a name for you such as WLAN 0. Once you see the adapter name such as WLAN 0, make note of it. And then the next command that we want to run is station WLAN 0. So that's going to be replaced with whatever adapter you found in the device list and type in scan. Press enter. That won't show you anything, but the following command will after you run it. We'll type station WLAN 0 or whatever adapter you got from your device list and then type get dash networks. This will list every single Wi-Fi network in proximity of you that the adapter has access to. Press enter and you'll get that list. At that point, you probably already know the SSID of the Wi-Fi network that you want to connect to, but this gets you a list of those SSIDs. Following that, we'll type in station WLAN 0 connect space the SSID. So for example, if my network was called Savvy Network, I'd type it here and this is the SSID I would be trying to connect to Savvy Network. After that, I will be asked for a paraphrase, also known as a password to the network. Type in your password to your network and you will then be connected to the network. If I hit this in, I'll get an error telling me that the Savvy Network doesn't exist. That's because I'm not using Wi-Fi. I'm just showing you how to set it up right now. It's a fairly easy process. After you've entered in the paraphrase and you haven't got any errors, you're now ready to exit out of this utility by typing exit, pressing enter, 
and you'll be back to the Linux console where you can issue commands. If you need a little more help with this, I'll post some more information in the description below on how to set up your Wi-Fi network with some examples, but let's continue on. We're making great headway. Also, if you haven't already, smash that like button and let's continue by pinging archlinux.org. This will confirm we have a connection. I'm getting a reply back. Everything seems good and well there. So I'm clearing things out. And now I'll continue and sync the time so it's correct. I can do this by typing time, date, CTL, all one word, space, set, dash, NTP, space, true, press enter. That will sync the time. And then if we type in time, date, CTL, space, status, that will tell us the status of the current time. It says that the system clock is synchronized and the NTP service is active so it can read down the time from a server. Now we're ready to launch the CF disk partitioning tool, which will allow us to create our EFI and root file system partitions. I won't be partitioning for swap today because we can always create a swap file later or add it in after the fact. All right, and our next step will be to launch the CF disk partitioning tool, which will allow us to create our EFI and brute file system partition. I won't be partitioning for swap today because we can always create swap later or add it in after the fact. So in order to run CF disk, I'll type CF disk space then I need to specify the device I want to run CF disk on. It's going to be my storage device. You might have multiple storage devices like I do. First off, you want to go under the forward slash DEV dev directory for devices, another forward slash, and if I tab a couple times, I'll see the various different choices I have. The main ones we're interested in are going to be if you have an NVMe drive, it'll probably be labeled under NVMe. I do see a few of those in mine is as well. There's also SDA potentially for other solid state disks, but you'll want to make absolute sure you're selecting the proper disk because you will be repartitioning that disk in order to take up all the free space. This install does assume you are installing this on a disk that has nothing on it and is only going to contain Arch Linux. So for example here, mine's an NVMe solid state drive. So if I start typing in NVMe, and I tab, I'll see the various different options under that. Mainly, I'm concerned with two things, this NVMe 0 and 1, or the NVMe 1 and 1. So I know I have two different disks here. I've also checked in my BIOS to confirm which disk is which. You can also use this CF disk tool as well by going through all the options, meaning I'll check NVMe 0 and 1 first, and then I can check the NVMe 1 and 1 second. I know this is the proper disk, so I'm going to select mine and press enter. After that, I can press enter once more and the CF disk tool will launch. Before you enter here, you might actually get an option to select a label if your hard disk doesn't already have one. Select GPT and then you can continue. Then you'll see this screen here. It says at the top that dev NVMe 1 and 1 for me is selected. Yours might be a little different depending on the disk that you have selected. But what's important to look for is complete free space here and the proper size of the storage disk which you want to install Arch Linux on. So I'm confirming that the 477 gigs matches what I know my storage space should be and where I want to install Arch Linux onto. It does. This is great. I also see that it's completely free space, so I have nothing on here anyway, because after this portion is done, we will be overwriting whatever's on the disk to have our own partitions created and formatted. So I'll create my EFI partition first by selecting enter. And it says down here in the partition size, how much space do I want? Well, for an EFI partition, 512 megabytes is the suggested amount. You can go, of course, above this. Some people like putting in a gig, but I'll put in 512 followed by a capital M, which stands for megabytes. And then I can press enter. That will now create a dev NVMe 1 N1 partition 1 P1. And it says it starts and ends at a certain location. It's 512 megabytes in size, but it's of type Linux file system. We don't want that. We want to go over to type with the first device now selected, press enter and then go up to the very top where we have the EFI system type. We'll press enter on that. 
and now the type is changed EFI system. This is correct. It's 512 megabytes, all great. And we have some free space after the fact. And this is what we want to use the rest of for our root file partition. This is where all your files, libraries, and directories will exist. And the EFI system is really just used for the boot up process. Let's press enter on this one. And the partition size will default to the maximum amount right off the bat. That's how much I want to use for this anyway. So I will confirm this by hitting enter. And then I'll see the rest of the size has been taken over by a type called Linux files. That's correct. And on the left hand side, I have these two partitions now under dev. NVMe 1 N1 with P1 and P2 partition 1 and partition 2. Great. That all looks good. And make sure to make note of these two names here on the left because we will be using those names here in a moment in order to format those two partitions. I'm done using the tool and it says write partition table to disk. This might destroy data. Of course, we have a completely empty storage disk, so I'm confident in the fact that I can write these two partitions to that disk. Of course, if you are too, make sure to do this. As it says, this can destroy data if you're trying to overwrite a disk that already exists with partitions on it. After I'm done, I'll press enter and it's asking me, am I sure that I want to write to the disk? I'm going to type in yes and press enter once more. It says things have been written and altered. I'll then quit out of the program by going over to quit and pressing enter. All right, now I will format those two partitions we just created. So first off, I'm going to type mkfs.fat space dash capital F 32 forward slash dev forward slash the location of the first partition, which is my EFI partition. So NVMe 1N1P1. Then I'll press enter. That's formatted things for me now. And then I'll do a second format, mkfs.ext4 space forward slash dev forward slash NVMe, and then my second drive, so 1N1P2. Press enter on that one. Mine's telling me that there are some remnants of another file system located here. This might be because I cleaned things up not too long ago, so I'm going to proceed anyway. And it looks like all is done now, ready to continue on. And if you still haven't, go smash that like button for me. We're now ready to mount the root file partition. We'll type mount and then again space forward slash dev forward slash NVMe 1N1. I want to do P2 partition 2. That was my root file partition. So make sure you don't get that messed up. And then space forward slash M and this will mount the device to a specific directory called MNT. I'll press enter. Now that it's mounted, I will create a new directory for the EFI so that we can also mount our EFI partition. We'll do MKDIR space forward slash MNT forward slash EFI. That will create our new directory. And now we can mount again the forward slash DEV forward slash NVMe and one P1 because partition one NVMe one and one P1. Remember partition one was the EFI partition and I will mount that in the forward slash MNT forward slash EFI directory. Then I'll press enter. And after everything is mounted, we're ready to install a few system packages, which are the, the base package, the Linux kernel package, and the Linux firmware pack. We'll do this using packstrap. So we'll type P-A-C-S-T-R-A-P packstrap space forward slash MNT space base space Linux and space Linux dash firmware. We'll press enter and this might take a few minutes to pull down everything from the internet and install the proper packages that were chosen. This all depends on your internet speed. It shouldn't take too terribly long, but after it's finished, you'll get back to your Linux console. All right, we're dropped back into the console. I'll clear things out so we have a fresh slate here and I'm going to generate the UUID for the disk by typing gen fstab base dash capital U in the mount directory, so forward slash MNT. And then I will send that to the forward slash MNT forward slash ETC forward slash fstab file. I'll press enter. I won't get any confirmation or anything. You can, however, check the MNT, etc., ETC, FSTAB file with some type of a text editor like Nano or Vim if you're curious to see if things went through properly and that there were no errors. But at this point, I'm ready to change the root directory. But before we do, if you want to learn more about Arch, 
and other operating systems, take a moment and subscribe below and we'll type ARCH dash CH root space forward slash MNT. This will change our root directory to the root file partition we have mounted on the MNT directory. Let's press enter. And now we're logged in as root under the new mounted directory. So after we changed the root directory, we are now in our newly created root file partition. This means that this is a clean root directory and only has a few base packages that exist on here. We'll need to make sure to install some networking packages as well as something like sudo for elevating user privileges. We'll do that later to be able to use our system more efficiently after this install process. I guess at this point, it's as good as any to install a network manager. So here's a wireless network manager that I like using and that I have started using. We can install it by doing pacman space dash capital S Y U space IWD and I'll press enter for this one. And it says here, do I wanna proceed with the installation? Yes, I do. So that will install IWD for me. So I have it after I'm done with the full installation. This is very good because I can then connect just like I did earlier to my wireless connection. But if I didn't have this package, there would be no way to connect to a network. Now, some of you might be using a wired connection, so you'll need some type of package for that. I'll install both network managers just to have them. It doesn't mean that they're enabled, they just take up a little extra space here, but it's better to have both of these than to have none and have no way to connect to the internet after the install process. So I'll do pacman space dash SYU. I'll do the netctl network manager. I'll also include dialog and then space DHCP CD as well as the WPA underscore supplicant and finally space IF plug D. All these packages may help you with networking later, so we might as well have them right now installed on the root file partition. I'll press enter and I'll select enter for the default case here for resolving my domain names and then press enter again to finish install here. All right, and all those packages have been downloaded and installed. We're ready to continue on the install at this point. I can also install if I use pacman syu I'll do the terminus font. I like having something that I can read right after I'm done with the install portion and I'm in my installed image. So I'll do that right now as well. After I'm finished with that, I'm ready to add a user. Let me clear things out and I'll type in user add. Now this will be a user that can have elevated super privileges using sudo, but we'll have a home directory for this one and it will be a different user than the root user, which is a good thing to have. So I'll have user add space dash capital G. Then you can add in the various different groups you want this user to belong to. I'll do the wheel group comma audio group comma video group and that's enough for me now you can add more groups in after the fact if necessary i'll also do space dash m this will create a home directory for this user and i'll type in my username so i'm using savvy nick you can use whatever you'd like and then press enter now that's created our user as well as their home user directory now i'll type in passwd and then follow that up with a space and the username savvy nick this will allow me to set my password up for my user account if i press enter it's asking me for a new password put your password in just because it's not showing up doesn't mean that it's not typing it is in fact typing in your password press enter when you're ready it'll ask you to confirm that password now so type it in again confirm it if everything adds up it'll tell you that the password was updated successfully. We're making it pretty far at this point. We're getting towards the end here. Congratulations if you've made it this far. Make sure to smash that like button. And since we've already set up our user password, let's set up the root password. We can do that by just simply typing pass WD and pressing enter, nothing after the fact. It's asking for a new password. Now you can make this different than your user password. It's actually wise to do that. So I'll make another password for my root user type that in and confirm that password a second time. And it says my root user password has now been updated successfully. We're good to go there. We'll be able to log in with the normal user and a root user. Next, I will install a tool that will help elevate our privileges for our normal users. So that's sudo. If I type in pacman space dash syu space sudo, that will get the proper package that we need. I'll proceed with the installation. And now we have to make edits 
to the configuration file for sudo. Let me clear things out and type in editor, all in caps, equals, you can either use nano or vim, whatever you're comfortable using, or some other text editor that you like as well. I'll use nano for ease of use, and then space, type in vi sudo. So instead of nano, you could have typed in vim or some other editor that you wanted to use. Press enter, and it says that nano doesn't exist. I forgot to install it. So I will do that now. I will type in pacman space dash syu, and I'll install both vim space and nano, and give this a few moments here. Press enter. All right, let's retry using that again. So I want the editor, all caps, equals nano, space, vi, sudo. All right, this time that successfully worked out for me. It opened up the sudoers file. And I'm looking for a line here that mentions wheel. It's already in here, so I don't have to do extra work. It's currently commented out, but the root user basically has privileges to everything and anything. And we want to also give the wheel group privileges to anything and everything. This is because I specified my savvy Nick user that I created for myself as part of the wheel group. So this makes it easy to allow that user to have elevated privileges when using sudo. So I will erase the hashtag in front, which was commenting out this line. And I want to make sure to save this file after I've removed that by pressing control X, at least here for nano. And yes, I want to save the modified buffer. So I'll press Y and then the file name to write by default is fine. I'll press enter and I'm back to my console. We're now ready to set up a bootloader. I'll clear things out. And next I'll get the bootloader by typing pacman space dash syu, followed by grub, which is the bootloader I choose to use. You can also install some other bootloader if you'd like it in place of grub, but that's the one I'm going with today. And then I want the EFI boot MGR package as well. So I got the grub and EFI boot manager package. I'll press enter at this point. It's going to ask me if I want to continue. Yes, I do. And now we can move on with the grub install. I'll clear things out. And now I'll type grub dash install space two dashes a target, which is equal to x86 underscore 64 for 64 bits, followed by a dash EFI, since we're installing this for an EFI-based BIOS system, and then we'll specify the EFI directory by typing dash dash EFI dash directory, then equals forward slash EFI forward slash another space dash dash bootloader dash ID. We can set that equal to whatever we really want, but I'll set it to arch and then I'll press enter. This will install for the x86 64-bit EFI-based platform, and it says it did. It installed, it finished, and there were no errors reported, so everything looks good. Let's now create a grub configuration file. We can do that by typing grub-mkconfig for make config. We'll do space dash o followed by forward slash boot forward slash grub forward slash grub dot cf. Press enter again. This will generate our grub config file, and it did. It found a couple images. Great. We are now ready to exit out of this root file partition by typing exit. That'll take us back to the original console in live media. We'll now want to reboot and rearrange the boot order in our BIOS once again so we can select the proper storage disk that we just got done installing Arch Linux on. Otherwise, BIOS might boot you back into the installer on the live media that you flashed earlier and you're on right now. How do we do this? So at this point, reboot your computer. I'm just going to type in reboot and that will get things started for me. As things are booting back up, I'll hit the delete or F2 key to get into my BIOS again. And I'll look at my boot priority and I see that Arch is the very first thing selected already. The system has already recognized this disk for me, which is great. I don't have to move things around in the boot priority. You might. I'm going to hit F8. As you can see here, I have different types of selections because I have multiple operating systems on different storage disks, but I want the one that says Arch for myself. So I'll continue on. Make sure to have it as your first boot priority or the first disk to boot in your boot order. After I do that, I'll get a screen that says GNU Grub the version number, and I have two options here, Arch Linux or the advanced options for Arch Linux. I'm going with Arch Linux. This is a great sign. If you made it this far, congratulations. 
you're about to boot into your new Arch Linux system. So press enter and give it a few moments to boot in. All right, it looks like it's ready for us to log in. I'll type in my username, so Savvy Nick for me, that I created earlier, and then my password for the user. And if everything goes successfully, it'll say Savvy Nick at Arch Linux. Let me set my font so that it's easier to read. All right. Couple things to check out. First, I want to see if I can log in as a super user with this current user. I'll press sudo su and then type in the password for my user account and look at that, I'm logged in as the root user. Great. There are a couple things I want to mention real quick. We do need to set up some of the locale information. So if I do vim etsy forward slash locale dot gen, I'll need to go through and uncomment the specific locale or character set that's, that pertains to my computer and my system. English US is correct for me, so it's nice that it's right here available. The en underscore US UTF-8 for me, that's fine. I'll make sure to save and exit out of this file by typing colon X, and that has been written now. Following that, I want to run the locale-gen. That will generate the proper locale. And the other thing I want to do is set the language variable by doing vim. I'm going to do forward slash etsy forward slash locale and create a new file, the conf, locale.conf. Open that up. And in here, all I need to type in is the language that I just used. So en underscore us dot utf dash eight. And then save and exit out of this one as well. If you do set a keyboard layout or want to keep a keyboard layout persistent, you'll need to specify that key map inside of vim space forward slash etsy forward slash v console dot config. In this file, it'll be a new file created. You can specify a key map such as key map equal no Latin one, like I showed earlier when you could select a proper key map. If you specify it in here, the system will then consider this your default key map instead of the US standard key map. I won't save this one, so I'll exit out. Finally, one other thing that uh, you might want to set up is the host name. So the current host name for the computer is Arch Linux. If you don't want that by default, you can edit that in the vim forward slash etsy forward slash host name file. And in here, just type in your host name. So I'm using, let's do Savvy Nick. That should be fine. I'll save and exit out of this one. That's all you need in here. This is a new file. And then let's edit the vim etsy host file. And down here, we'll add in a couple entries, 127.0.0.1 for localhost, and then colon colon one for again, localhost. Finally, we'll do 127.1.1. We'll type in our host name. So I use Savvy Nick. Of course, you can use whatever you want for your host name. Then followed by local domain. And then we'll do again, you can be using tabs here, Savvy Nick, your host name and then save and exit out of this file. All right, so now I'll clear things out and let me try pinging archlinux.org. And it says here, temporary failure in name resolution. So this is why I mentioned before that you need to install network packages before ending the install process because now we're well equipped to set up our network here on this side of things. If we type IWCTL again, it says we're waiting for IWD to start. So the service hasn't been started quite yet. We need to enable that service. I'll press control C and type system CTL followed by enable IWD.service. That will enable the service. I'll reuse the command and change the enable to start instead. This will start the service now that it's enabled. I will also do system CTL, enable the system D dash resolve D dot service. So we're system D resolve service and press enter for that one. And I want to make sure to start the service as well. So I'll type in start and this will allow us to resolve domain names as well as start the IWD service. One other config file I want to create and edit. Uh, let's do vim space. Of course, you can be using nano for this if you're more comfortable using nano. In the etsy forward slash iwd forward slash, we'll make a new file called main 
config, C-O-N-F, press enter. And in here, I'll add a few lines. First line is open bracket general, close bracket, new line, enable network configuration. Make sure that's all one word and it's camel case like shown. And then true at the end here, we'll add a new line in between and type network in brackets and then name resolving service is going to be system D, which we just enabled. All right, I'm saving and exiting out of this one now. And let's try running IWCTL once more. Now we can run it. Let me make things appear a little better here, clear things out, IWCTL. And now we go through that exact same process as we did earlier in order to set up our Wi-Fi connection. So a basic recap, it's pretty easy. Let me type in help and we'll look at the various different commands available. First, we wanna run the device space list command. Then we wanna make sure to take note of the device listed. For example, if mine is WLAN zero, then we wanna do station, type in the LAN adapter, so WLAN zero space scan, then station WLAN zero space get networks, and then station WLAN zero connect to a specific SSID. You might already know this, so it might be as easy as just typing station WLAN zero connect your SSID and typing in your paraphrase. So let's go through this fairly quick device list and you'll press enter. Make note of whatever adapter is available for your wireless network. Then type in station WLAN or whatever you have. Scan, press enter, then station WLAN zero get networks with a dash in between those two. That'll get all your networks that are currently available. I can't do this because I don't have a wireless network here. And finally, once you found the SSID of the one you can connect to, type in station followed by the adapter. So WLAN zero connect space the SSID. So for example, if my network was called Savvy Network, I would use that, press enter, and it would ask you for a paraphrase if it could find that network. As long as you enter in the correct paraphrase or password, then you can type in exit and you will then have access to ping out. All right, and with that done, I'll reboot the system real quick. All right, and once things are rebooted and you're back into your normal user, at this point, you should be able to ping archlinux.org one more time to see if you have a connection. I sure do. It, I'm getting a reply back. So that's great. Now I have a connection to the internet. And if you have a wired connection, you'll have to set things up a little bit differently. I won't necessarily go through that. Most people have wireless connections nowadays with a Wi-Fi adapter. But if you do need help on that portion, I'll make sure to post some information in the description below on how to get that set up. You do have the proper packages already, but you do need to make a few configuration changes in order to get NetCTL working with a wired connection. And that's really it. Now you should be excited because you can start using your Arch Linux system. Congratulations if you've made it this far. You've successfully installed everything and anything needed to get your system running and for it to be usable with networking. So at this point, you can install some form of a desktop environment, a window manager, or if you just wanna keep it a Linux console and use it like this, this is about as minimal as you can go here. You can also install your favorite packages at this point using Pac-Man, a great package manager. It's not an easy process, but it's definitely rewarding. Just to show you one package, and I'll just do sudo pacman space dash syu, and I'll install the NeoFetch package just to get some information about my system. Then if I type in NeoFetch, look at that. I have Savvynik at Savvynik setup. It's the Arch Linux x86 underscore 64-bit architecture. Kernel 5.11.4 running here. It's been up for only four minutes, 132 packages installed. I'm using Bash as my default shell. We're currently in the Linux console TTY1. This is an AMD Ryzen 7 3700X with 16 threads, eight cores at 3.6 gigahertz using an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 6 Super. The memory usage is very minimal at 226 megabytes out of the 32 gigs available on the system. And I wanna leave you off with one last thing. The next video will be how to install xmonad on this arch linux base installation the setup is from a discord member who put a lot of work into it shout out to xvara for doing an amazing job you won't want to miss that one i figured i'd let you know about that video 
I will also be posting it in the comment section or the description once it's out fairly soon here. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please post them in the comment section below. Also, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and make sure to smash that like button. Catch me and a great community on Discord, and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.